It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, yes, I was here for another conference, and I'm about to start being a tourist, and um, the, the, that won't start until after 5 o'clock. But, uh, oh, great. Thank you. I, okay. So I'm going to try to really just hit on some um, really key points about HIV prevention and treatment in children, and I um, thank the previous speaker for that great introduction about um, Oh, now advanced? Okay. It's not advancing here, like I can't see what things up there. Um, all right, so I'm going to um, briefly cover a little bit of history, hit some key points about uh, prevention, some key points about treatment, and then really talk about what are the key take-home messages that I want anybody that's providing HIV care in, in this region to um, think about or be able to Perfect, thank you. Um, Keep in mind uh, when, as they're taking care of HIV infected individuals. So, 1981, I was a first year medical student. Um, HIV wasn't taught about, PCR didn't exist. Um, it was, med school must have been a whole lot simpler back then. Um, but there was the first launch of a space shuttle. Prince Charles and Lady Diana were wed. And there was the first report of homosexual men dying due, due to immunodeficiency. And at that time, I thought, well, that's really fascinating, but um, it doesn't really impact me because I'm going to take care of kids, and so it's never going to impact kids. And I went on for the, on my career. Um, and then, but then several years later, as I was doing my pediatric infectious disease fellowship in the late 80s, uh, there were two little six-month-old boys who were the first kids in our community who survived their presentation. So we'd had several other HIV-infected kids before, but they died when they presented with their pneumocystis. So these two little boys, nobody wanted to take care of them. The stigma was horrible that doctor's offices didn't even want to see them, and if those kids presented to those offices, um, the, the office staff insisted on um, gowning, gloving, and not touching them, and sterilizing every room they walked through. Um, so some of the fear and the stigma that we saw back then, that we lived through back then, um, you know, it, you, I see it happening in other places, and um, it, it does improve over time, but it, it certainly takes a whole lot of effort. In 1987, the FDA approved the first um, antiretroviral agent, um, AZT. Um, as you know, it's also got a bunch of other names. Um, two years later, AZT syrup was first approved for children. So that's a common theme I want to um, bring to your attention. The drugs for children are often approved a year or two later after the drug is approved for adults, so there's often a delay in when we can get access to them for children. And the children needed syrup. They couldn't take the adult pills. You had to figure out their dose on a per kilo basis, so it was a various volumes, but the, most kids can't swallow pills, so you have to have a liquid. And that consistently has happened over the years as drugs become available for adults, there's usually a delay in when you can get those drugs for children. So the first studies showed that um, children had great response to AZT when you treated them um, with it. And actually, some kids that had frank encephalopathy actually woke up and started improving um, with a drug that really wasn't all that active. Uh, but there were really significant toxicities with the AZT. We subsequently had uh, a, a bunch of additional uh, nukes. Uh, DDI, 3TC, D4T, and DDC. Most of you recognize that we don't use most of those drugs anymore, um, primarily because of the significant toxicities associated with them. It was great that we could treat kids, um, but still the outcomes were poor. We couldn't really, um, uh, we, we couldn't return anybody to normal. We could just sort of slow the progression of the disease, and the children were still um, dying. Um, the challenges in, ter in, in children um, included the consistent delay, um, you know, really annoying me when you could get those drugs for the adults and I couldn't get the same drug for children. Um, and that actually happened with PrEP as well, where um, PrEP was approved for 18 and up and I couldn't get it for the 17-year-old MSM who needed it just as much. Um, there's not always a pediatric formulation. There's several drugs where there still isn't a pediatric formulation uh, for us to prescribe. 
And then um, there's also the issue of children who grew up with sequential mono and du dual therapy who are now 20 years old or 25 years old who have incredibly resistant virus because of what we didn't know about treating them back then or what we only had available back then. When those kids hit 20 or 30, they are often very difficult to suppress with and require very complicated drug regimens. But what did heart mean when we, when we had it? Um, and now we just refer to it as art, not heart, um, since all, all art should be heart. Um, we had a, an 18-year-old hemophiliac who was, um, looked like he was 10 years old. He was completely prepubertal, wasted, um, no CD4 cells, and you know, appeared like he would, didn't have many more months to live. Heart became available. Uh, I swear he went through puberty in six months, shot up a foot. Um, he he um, came into clinic one day complaining of hand pain. We thought peripheral neuropathy, what's wrong with him? Turns out he felt so good he helped build a house and he was carrying bricks all day and his hands hurt from, from carrying bricks. It was wonderful to see a, a young man turn into a young man and actually become healthy um, when we had seen nothing for years but kids just wasting and dying. Um, several of the younger children went from being wasted and sickly to being <coughs> normal, healthy kids in their schools. Um, and, and then we were able to start treating children um, shortly after birth. So if you diagnose a child as infected at birth or two weeks of life, you could start them on treatment before they were three months. And uh, they would thrive. They would never um, have any evidence of immune suppression um, or delays. And some of the children that we treated um, are now um, in their late 20s um, and are completely healthy and are having families of their own. Um, but I want to pause for a minute and talk about, well, how do you approach um, an, an HIV-infected child? And the first thing I want to make people aware of is diagnosis in young children is different than that in, in adults. Uh, antibody is passed from mother to baby at the time of delivery and can persist up to 18 months. So you can't use an antibody to test to diagnose infection in a child under 18 months of age. You're going to have to make the diagnosis with PCR. Um, it's a tricky subject. Um, a qualitative RNA PCR is the only currently FDA approved test, but there's years and years of experience using DNA PCR. DNA PCR is quite reliable if you can get it. Um, if the only thing you can get is a viral load, which is a quantitative RNA-PCR, um, that will suffice. Just don't consider a measure of 50 or 60 to be proof that the child's infected. Um, but you'll want to do a PCR as a, as a way to identify infected kids. Um, if you know a baby's been exposed, you're going to want to do a test at birth, um, and at least one test at four to six weeks, and one test at, at four months. That's in a non-breastfed child. If your patient is breastfed, you'll want to get two negative tests after the child has stopped breastfeeding, after the last exposure. If you do diagnose a child as being infected, you do want to initiate treatment as soon as possible. One reason is children can deteriorate extremely rapidly. Um, another reason is that 50% of kids um, who are infected at birth will be um, dead by two years of age if you don't treatment. The, the, the children can deteriorate very rapidly and the, presenting, the presentation of their deterioration might be encephalopathy and you'll have irreversible brain damage in that child. So please, if you diagnose an infected child, you want to initiate treatment as soon as possible. One thing that people forget about, but I really want to make sure you're aware of. So say you do make a diagnosis and you start a child on treatment at two months of age and they do well and they're biologically suppressed, and at two years of age, you decide to do an antibody test just to prove that they're really infected. A child started on treatment prior to three months of age may never develop antibody. They're still infected, but they don't have an immune response to HIV. So please don't do an antibody test and find out it's negative and say, oh, this child, that must have been a false positive PCR. Um, be aware that if you are effectively starting on treatment before three months of age, they may stay antibody negative for life until they become a teenager and stop taking their meds. But they, um, if you do stop it, you will see viral rebound um, relatively quickly. 
I'm not going to go into all the, um, the nuances of whether or not you pick nevirapine-based treatment or colitra-based treatment or Altegra-based treatment. I just want to give you a couple points about treatment. First of all, don't ever use colitra in a child less than two weeks of age. Um, the, the, uh, the solvent, the diluent that is in liquid colitra is toxic for children less than two weeks of age, so please do not use it. But after two weeks of age, you can use it. It tastes like doo-doo. Um, it's, it, it's really hard to get kids to take it, but it actually has the best outcomes in terms of continued suppression of virus. Nevirapine actually tastes pretty good. Um, kids don't mind taking it, um, but it will have a greater failure rate than the Kalitra-based regimen. Um, the Raltegravir-based regimens are relatively new. Um, it's a bit complicated to mix up the Kalitra, or, sorry, the Raltegravir that mother has to um, prepare each dose and um, measure out then the amount she needs and then discard the amount she doesn't need. So I wouldn't you probably can't get it here, but even if you could, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be quick to jump to that yet. Um, but some recent good news is um, Genvoya um, last year was FDA approved down to 25 kilos. Um, so if you have a child that can swallow pills that's 25 kilos or up, you, you can use Genvoya. It's the same as the adult dose. And then Big Tegravir um, was just two weeks ago, FDA approved for down to 25 kilos. Um, and it's a tiny pill. You don't, can't really appreciate it in the pictures, but the big Tegravir pill is really tiny. Um, it's the, the first kids we gave it to were just giddy. They were jumping around the room. They were so excited that it was such a tiny pill to swallow. So um, th there are improvements in the one pill once a day for kids. But the limitations, there's still no cure other than the one or two cures that have been widely publicized. Therapy is lifelong, and if you're starting it when somebody's three months of age, there's, they're going to have many, many, many years of um, antiretroviral treatment. It is expensive, and the rate of increasing art distribution does not keep pace with the number of new infections. So how can we prevent new infections? And I'm only going to talk about prevention of mother-to-child transmission, because you've had many other talks to cover the um, prevention in adults. So very briefly, um, the first major prevention study um, was, was um, PACTG 076, and um, this was done in the early 90s um, after AZT became available. And it was, a, it was fascinating because one side of the room insisted that you, you couldn't do this study because nobody should ever get AZT, it was poisonous. The other side of the room said that you can't do this study because um, everybody should get AZT, and therefore, um, you, you, know, you shouldn't randomize anybody to placebo. And then the middle of the room said, well, it should be a decision between each woman and her doctor, but, but the doctor has no data to help this woman make a decision. So um, after much fighting, um, protests, demonstrations, and um, special meetings, uh, the study finally did go forward. And in 1994, on a Monday morning, um, was a, a major advance was announced. Um, where the results clearly showed that in relatively healthy HIV-infected women who don't breastfeed, you could reduce mother-to-child transmission uh, from 25% to 8%, 67% reduction. And that was the start of really the successes in uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission. In 1999, Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation um, really work, started working to implement mother-to-child prevention programs um, throughout the world, and they supported um, 17 different countries. And it brings us now to our current state of the art, which is in developed countries, um, all pregnant women should receive uh, combination antiretroviral therapy, the baby should get AZT for four to six weeks, and no breastfeeding. Um, there should be a C-sec, an elective C-section prior to the onset of labor if the um, mother d does not have a viral of less than 1,000. And all efforts combined leads to a transmission rate of less than 1%. In developing countries, um, women should also receive combination art throughout pregnancy and during the period of time of breastfeeding and potentially for life. Um, we know that women are, are actually pretty good about taking it during pregnancy. They're not so good about taking it when they're just doing it for their own health. Um, generally, exclusive breastfeeding is recommended through six months of life and nevirapine to the baby if mom isn't on highly active therapy. 
transmission is in that uh, situation is reduced, but um, somewhat variable depending on the country. In the U.S., when um, we implemented uh, some of these guidelines, you can see that the uh, mother-to-child transmission rate dropped off pretty substantially. But in um, worldwide, there's still between 150,000 and 180,000 newly infected children each year. So it's a 70% decrease, um, but we're still far from elimination. I just want to make a couple of comments. I think you've probably already seen this slide today, but I want to point out that of the 18,000 new infections in the Middle East, um, 1,300 of them are in children. 5,000 HIV-infected women deliver each year, approximately. Of those, only 1,100 are on antiretroviral therapy. So less than 25% of the HIV-infected women in this region are treated with antiretrovirals during pregnancy, which is why there's almost a 25% rate of transmission from mother to child in this region. So women aren't being diagnosed during pregnancy. And when I hear people talk about targeted testing, I understand that you'll get the most positives if you target a high-risk population, but we had many, many years of targeted testing in the U.S. And what I can tell you is it doesn't work. You guys aren't going to be great at picking out who should be tested. Um, the, 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 you, you know, Docs think they can look at somebody and identify which woman is the IV drug user or which woman has a, is married to um, a, an IV drug user. We're not good at that. To really prevent mother-child transmission, you have to do universal testing during pregnancy. So um, prevention of transmission, universal testing of pregnant women, ARC for all infected women, but especially those who are pregnant, and if mom's not virologically suppressed, um, C-section for delivery. Um, for the infants, um, antiretrovirals for the infant um, for four to six weeks of life, zidovudine or nivirapine. Um, additional therapies are needed. I just want to um, give you one little um, piece of data. So we presented these data at CROI. One of the additional approaches that people are investigating is active or passive immunization. And um, these are data with, there's several ongoing studies looking at uh, passive antibody for prevention of transmission in adults. And we're completing a study, a phase one study of um, anti-HIV monoclonals in HIV-exposed infants. And these monoclonals, and these are different doses, and this is a different antibiotic, but you can see two months after this, these babies receive a single dose, they still have high levels of these antibodies in their blood. So maybe a future approach might be passive immunization where you give a single dose of a monoclonal antibody that could last up to six months of life and um, potentially give you a different approach for prevention in infants. So take home message, um, and this is something I, I, I didn't previously mention, but I remind you. If you diagnose HIV infected in, infection in a woman, please test every one of her children. I've seen several cases where mom's in care, mom's doing fine, and nobody bothered to test the six-year-old, the eight-year-old, or the ten-year-old until the child showed up with cryptococcal meningitis or disseminated TB. I don't care if the child looks healthy. Test every one of her children. Um, treat infected children as early as possible. Test all women during pregnancy. Um, treat them as early as possible. And um, uh, keep your eye out for new developments um, as we look for better ways to prevent uh, transmission and uh, care of children. So thank you.